So um, thanks everyone uh, for joining us, us this evening. My name is Maria Mialkovich. I'm a client technical leader with IBM. Um, we had a little bit of um, some scheduling changes with my colleagues, so um, the, the description on the um, uh, Meetup uh, website is a little different from the perspective I'm going to take this evening. Um, I don't have a, a ton of time, and I wanted to um, touch on a, on a handful of different topics, and my hope is that some, if something piques your interest, come out and talk to us, and, um, and, and we can elaborate and go into more detail and um, uh, go from there. So, so what I wanted to do um, was summarize what uh, else, and I, th I thought I was going to go after Chris originally, so, so Chris is going to show you an example of a great use case that, that he's built uh, um, working with, with our clients and um, what we can do. Um, and so, so I wanted to, um, against that uh, work, uh, uh, demonstrate what else IBM is bringing to the AI table. And um, so, so, you know, we are a, um, an organization, a very large organization. We've been around for, for many, many years. And um, I, I will say, um, when it comes to AI, I don't know if we um, sometimes do the best job of, um, uh, you know, highlighting what we do in particular, because we do so many different things. And in this um, uh, uh, particular uh, uh, collection of points that I've, I've um, pre prepared for you today, I wanted to kind of show you that, um, we still very much come at things from, from two different angles. So, so we absolutely um, have to cater to the needs of our enterprise clients. And so I wanted to um, uh, share with you some of the obstacles and challenges that enterprises are having. I anticipate a lot of you are students here today and, and perhaps you can keep that in mind as you're uh, doing your studies and, and um, um, deciding what to focus on. But um, um, you know, AI is a very different type of workload uh, from an IT perspective, unlike any other um, that we have encountered in the recent past. And, and so um, uh, there, there, at least from my perspective, there are many things that we first have to fix uh, with respect to society um, and problems that we have to solve. And, and a lot of them are research, uh, based on research. And so before we help enterprises, we kind of have to address those things too. So. Um, you know, I often take the position that 2018 was the year of hype, so, so there was a lot of hype around, um, you know, how deep learning is changing our lives, uh, what it can mean for enterprises, and, and people like, um, you know, those professors at U of T, um, A.J. Agrawal, that said, um, you know, a every company will become an AI software company, they don't know it yet. And you know, arguing that um, because you're reducing the price of prediction, you're changing the economics of doing business. And this is, in fact, the fundamental um, uh, impact that AI will have. But um, uh, you know, after all of that hype, the reality is that enterprises need help building, scaling, and deploying AI services and solutions. Um, and you know, based on the comments that, that Jeff uh, just made, economics matters. And, um, but um, society even needs more help, and, and I'll um, try to explain what I need there. So um, just some statistics again that um, we put together from an enterprise perspective. So kind of, you know, everybody agrees that we need AI as a competitive advantage, okay? But um, in reality, one in 20 companies have um, really incorporated AI um, into, into their offerings and processes. So these numbers don't add up, they don't match, again, um, executives feel AI is important, but um, only 18% of organizations have really done something meaningful, have really um, been successful at moving projects beyond pilots and POCs, okay? And, um, and, and often, um, you know, there's a few obstacles to that, but um, often, you know, these uh, respondents in these surveys cite um, access to resources and technical skills as, um, as one of the reasons. So, so, you know, at the end of the day, that's uh, great news for you. So um, th uh, those, are, those are worldwide surveys, but if we take a look at um, a Canadian landscape in perspective, there's a couple of articles uh, and blogs last fall um, that, um, that, that highlight Canadian firms fall behind in the adoption of arti artificial intelligence. So even though we have AMI, even though we have, um, you know, that school in Toronto and Vector Institute and Yoshua Bengio, and even though we have Mila and the best researchers in the world that, you know, really brought us the thaw of the AI winter and, um, 
uh, you know, really brought upon the big bang for deep learning, we are still last um, and in 10 countries in terms of AI adoption, okay? And, um, and so, and so um, uh, uh, some of these authors have suggested that it's perhaps because we Canadians have an ethics first approach um, at, around consent, transparency and bias and classic Canadian caution um, in, in taking some of this technology and innovation and moving it to production. So, so again, these are some of the very real challenges that organizations and enterprises are facing as they try to um, develop uh, 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 solutions and uh, services. So Element AI, again, you've likely heard of them, a, a, um, a very successful company uh, in artificial intelligence. Um, a, you know, quoting, AI is so hot right now, in spite of all the excitement, however, uh, modern AI has yet to establish itself in the enterprise road. So um, they, again, uh, cite talent gap and trustability as, um, as reasons. And so, and so, you know, we have those challenges from an enterprise perspective, and I stumbled across this on the, on the weekend. Um, there's a professor out of NYU, Amy Webb, um, who has um, uh, published a new book. It's, it's uh, supposed to drop at the beginning of March. Um, and and uh, she, um, you know, is adding to this hype and concern around the effects on AI on society. Um, and she really says, um, um, you know, that AI will bring upon, um, you know, a, 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 a uh, potential catastrophe for humanity and and you know there's still time to change it but um, um, uh, you know really suggesting uh, that um, even you know forget what enterprises are facing when they're trying to develop AI there's a lot of um, hype and and, uh, and um, really concern in society itself in terms of what are the implications of AI so um so so against that backdrop what does a company like IBM do? What's the approach that they take? And so, and so it's, you know, again, I come at it from, we have to support our enterprise clients, but um, a lot of these problems are still in the research realm. And so our IBM is a, at the end of the day, also a research and innovation uh, company. And so what I've done is I've, I've um, uh, uh, collected a couple of ideas that kind of show what we're doing to help researchers uh, or, or uh, businesses and then also um, what are the some of the latest things we've done in research from an AI perspective and things we've given back to the AI community such that you can then um, take and use these things Some of these things are free um, and you can adopt them in some of your work okay so um, again, back to my point on the only thing that is hotter in AI is explainable AI, and um, so so you should kind of keep that in uh, mind as you're as you're doing your work. And I uh, noted in um, uh, uh, Jeff's uh, comments there about um, uh, you know nobody caring about your algorithm. Well, I um, I would I would um, I would kind of add to that. You know, uh, folks do care about your algorithm, or nobody cares about your algorithm. Um, except you have to be able to explain it, right? So, um, um, because, um, you know, that is certainly a um, very uh, key uh, concern in enterprises and organizations looking to deploy these things. If you're a bank and you can't explain why you decline somebody uh, their credit, you're not going to get very far in your, um, in, in your model. So, um, from a Canadian perspective, a lot of um, investments and effort around uh, fair, ethical, trusted, explainable AI, uh, whether it's Graham Taylor and his um, uh, new Center for uh, Fair and Ethical AI at the University of Guelph, um, uh, RBC, uh, that um, we're supporting uh, with, with um, monetary commitments, uh, CIFAR uh, uh, in support of, of um, ethical AI, to the Montreal Declaration for Responsible AI. So, so even uh, in our Canadian landscape, uh, organizations, both um, uh, public and private sector, recognizing that these are important um, uh, topics. So, um, but um, back to my point on, um, on you know, today, uh, what we bring uh, to to the AI table, so to speak, um, and I'll and I'll come back to to the ethics uh, and and transparency of AI. I wanted to let you know um, uh, about a couple of things, and um, I'll start first with infrastructure. And so, as we all uh, can appreciate, infrastructure matters uh, with AI. Um, you know, Jeff Hinton came up with. Uh, neural networks many, many years ago, but it wasn't until these GPUs came around that we really made some meaningful progress and, um, and, and we all understand and can appreciate what um, having the right infrastructure means uh, for the economics of, of AI. And so um, I wanted to tell you about um, some great infrastructure that we have um, uh, in IBM. 
This infrastructure currently powers the um, uh, top two largest supercomputers on the planet, so I'll, I, I don't know if you've heard of them, but uh, they are the Summit and uh, Sierra supercomputers with the Department of Energy in the U.S. Um, they, are, they are very large, 4,600 uh, nodes is Summit. It has over a 250 petabyte file system. It has over uh, 27,000 Volta V100 GPUs, okay? So, so this um, supercomputer, I think when they first commissioned it in 2014, you know, it was supposed to be an HP system, but I, you know, I think it's evolved into one of the largest AI uh, supercomputers on the planet. And, um, um, you know, you know and, and kind of the evidence of that is that some of the, the uh, Gordon Bell uh, prize, five out of the six finalists ran on Summit and Sierra, and the work that they are doing are all AI applications. So um, uh, one of the extreme weather modeling ones, in fact, uh, uh, achieved a, um, a record of 1.13 exa ops, the fastest deep learning algorithm yet reported. So, um, so, so these are um, uh, excellent systems uh, for doing uh, uh, AI work at scale, and the um, the uh, uh, reality and, and the truth behind them is that um, they are a building block approach, and you can take this uh, system, this two-node, two-socket system that we have that's based on a power uh, system, a power processor architecture, and, um, uh, you know, it's got four GPUs that you in it, and, and you can use it either in a, you know, just as a single system or as a large um, uh, uh, supercomputer supercluster. So, um, so what is this uh, uh, system? How is it different, this AC922 power system? Uh, as we call it, different from uh, from other uh, GPU accelerated systems out there. We have a, a very unique differentiation. You may know what NVLink is. Um, uh, NVIDIA uh, has it in some of their systems and offerings where they have a special connection in between the GPUs. Um, this uh, system has NVLink between the CPU and the GPUs. Okay, so this is the only system out there um, that, um, that has uh, a non-PCI connection between the CPU and the GPU, and it gives you a 5 to 10x bigger bandwidth for moving data from your CPU to your GPU. And, you know, uh, deep learning, machine learning is, is really all about moving a lot of data back and forth into that GPU. And, um, and, and if you've got a bigger pipe to do it, you're going to be, um, uh, you know, training your models faster. Um, it also, uh, that NVLink also provides coherency in between the GPU and CPU memory. And so what that means then is that if your model doesn't fit into that GPU memory, you can then uh, leverage the system memory and um, you can then have larger batch sizes uh, and you can now support some of these models that are many, many, many layers deep. So, um, so it's a very uh, innovative system for, um, for, for doing um, uh, machine learning, deep learning. So, um, you know, back to my uh, comment on enterprises then, again, um, we, we uh, you know, started seeing that, um, um, you know, enterprises were really struggling on how to productionalize uh, AI work, okay? And so they, they um, you know, there's enterprises that want to buy off the shelf um, uh, uh, products that are, that are, you know, ready to go, ready to be put into production, but a lot of enterprises want to build their own models, want to build their own algorithms that's trained on their data, but they need a complete end-to-end -end pipeline for doing that. So that involves an environment uh, where they, where they um, do their data preparation, where they do their model development, um, uh, where then uh, they uh, uh, take that work and then they train those models um, and put them into production, so to speak. And then again, back to um, the point of being able to explain the models, um, uh, uh, checking to see whether they're fair, um, uh, measuring the models against business KPIs. You know, this is a complete uh, workflow, a complete pipeline, and we, uh, IBM, have brought that to the table um, such that we provide a complete uh, AI uh, uh, machine learning pipeline for, for enterprises to adopt, okay? Um, so that's based on a couple of uh, different offerings, Watson Studio, Watson Machine Learning, and Watson OpenScale. And, um, and, and you will see here um, one of the unique uh, features in Watson Studio in particular is um, we've taken some of the um, most common frameworks, the TensorFlows, the Cafes, the PyTorches, and uh, for the Power Platform in particular, we've compiled them and um, 
optimize them and, and um, such that you don't have to build them from source. You download them, you install them with a few commands, and, and you're ready to go. So then again, that saves a data scientist a lot of time um, in, instead of building a lot of those uh, algorithms from, from scratch. So um, you then uh, have your uh, environment where you, your Jupyter notebooks, um, your R, where you do your coding, where you can have a collaborative environment with many different um, um, uh, data scientists, you then uh, deploy them uh, to Watson Machine Learning where you, you can do model management, where you can do retraining. Um, and then um, what um, uh, we realize is that in some of these larger organizations, um, you know, uh, at this point, um, uh, AI crosses the HPC chasm, right? So, so you've got um, uh, companies like banks that have, you know, potentially hundreds of data scientists. They have different groups that need to do data science. And so how do you support the infrastructure needs of such an organization? And so um, what we've uh, uh, done is, where's my... Uh, we we um, this, uh, have an offering that's come out uh, from a system from our systems organization, which has now been um, uh, rebranded as Watson Machine Learning Accelerator. That um, really says if you want to do um, AI at scale, machine learning at scale, this is the right solution for you. In that um, we provide a Spark infrastructure to support multi-tenancy, uh, to uh, support many different scientists all working at the same time. And um, it, 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 it's underpinned by our, our um, experience and history in HPC clusters and HPC computing. So um, we, we have the ability there to do hyperparameter tuning. Um, and again, you know, as Jeff said, uh, a lot of machine learning, a lot of deep learning is doing things over and over again and iteratively. So if you've got the ability to do automated hyperparameter tuning, it really uh, saves you a lot of time. Okay, uh, elastic deep uh, distributed tra tra training again, um, the ability to um, support many people doing work at the same time, such as you don't have to look each other in the eye um, to kind of say you go first and then I'll go. Um, if if um, there are many people working at the same time, they can all be supported at the same time. Okay, um, so, so a complete just to summarize, then a complete end-to-end -end pipeline uh, for doing enterprise class AI. And I'll move on now to some of the more research-focused items um, around trust and explainability, which we feel are, are uh, big problems that need to be addressed and solved um, uh, both in research and the enterprise space. So we've defined the pillars of trust as fairness, explainability, exper ad ad adversarial robustness, and transparency. Okay, so making AI fair. So this is, um, um, you know, uh, 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 a, um, uh, uh, an offering that I wanted to make you aware um, that um, we announced last year known as AIF360. So this is an open source toolkit that's available to anyone. Uh, it's absolutely free. It contains 30, uh, more than 30 fairness metrics and checkers, uh, 10 bias mitigators. So it allows you to, um, to do uh, uh, fairness checking um, of your algorithms and then actually um, gives you uh, 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 opportunities to do bias mitigation. So not only does it detect the bias, it offers uh, the ability to mitigate the bias as well. So, um, so, so we offer this both as a, um, a, a toolkit that's open source, but also it underpins some of the, the uh, enterprise uh, products and offerings that we have. Okay, so making AI explainable, um, perhaps some of you are working this space or doing research in this space. Um, this is just one example of a paper we recently published, uh, Contrastive Explanations, that kind of says, we're gonna explain how an algorithm made the decision by the features that weren't there, okay? So um, uh, there's links to the paper if you wanna read more about that. Um, uh, again, explainability in action, Watson and open scale. So see there's some of the enterprise offerings again that have the ability to explain how a model arrived at its decision uh, such that you can um, uh, explain to the auditors, explain to, to the business leaders uh, what the model did at the end of the day. Okay, making AI secure. Again, a, some recent work on adversarial robustness toolkit. So it's the most comprehensive toolkit for attacking and defending um, uh, AI. Um, and, and similarly, um, we also have um, some recent work uh, from research on fair, um, federated and trusted artificial intelligence, again, where you incorporate blockchain uh, in, your, in your AI data set came from. 
um, where your model came from and make sure that nobody changed it as you're, you're doing your work. Okay, making AI transparent. Again, um, this, is, this is an interesting uh, offering, again, that, um, that we've put out there. Uh, the, the, um, uh, the easiest way to explain it would be uh, nutrition labels um, uh, for food that we have. So these are fact sheets that kind of say, uh, record all of the information again back to, you know, what was the data set that was used? Uh, what was the model that was used? Um, you know, where was it tested? Who tested it? And um, if you look at um, uh, what Alex Bene announced yesterday, I believe it was around um, some of the regulations that the Government of Canada is going to mandate around building AI services. This very closely resembles, um, again, having that um, lineage um, and explaining how, um, you know, the model was built and, and the approaches that were taken. So, um, again, these, these are recommendations, suggestions that we're putting out into the research community that suggesting that folks adopt, but um, you'll see um, uh, others will, will demand it as well. And then finally, um, uh, you know, topic of data sets uh, came up. I wanted to let you know about our diversity and faces data set. Uh, this is a um, data set of a million uh, annotated uh, records. It's a facial, um, uh, obviously, uh, the records are our faces. Uh, they contain intrinsic facial features. Uh, so the distances, for example, between your eyes and your nose, things like that. But, um, but it's one of the most comprehensive uh, data sets that um, uh, obviously, um, uh, you know, if you're going to build a model that leverages facial recognition that is going to be more fair and accurate and, um, and, 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 and unbiased. So you can also, this is, we've made this available to the research community, so if any of you are doing uh, work uh, in facial recognition, um, you, can, you can go out and grab this data set uh, and bi build your models based on that. And then finally, uh, looking forward, I wanted to just share some of the um, um, uh, areas that um, IBM was uh, looking um, or, or pursuing from a research perspective. Um, so we've kind of defined the evolution of AI um, as three things. So narrow AI, kind of where we are now. So deep learning we view as um, a single task, a si single domain with superhuman accuracy, uh, requires large amounts of labeled data. We see the next phase being broad AI, you know, so, so both learning and reasoning, uh, multitask, multi-domain, multimodal, um, and, um, you know, having the ability to learn with much less data. And then finally, you know, perhaps um, quite a few years off this concept of, um, of general AI. So um, we've um, recently partnered uh, and, and um, invested in a uh, industry academic partnership with MIT and um, focused on not only algorithms but the, fi uh, the physics of AI, industry applications, and again advancing um, uh, shared prosperity or, or AI for social good. So, um, but in addition to algorithms, again, back to this topic of infrastructure and um, recognizing that infrastructure matters. Um, so, so, you know, in today's um, uh, uh, climate, GPUs are kind of the go-to uh, device for um, doing um, uh, AI and deep learning, but, um, you know, I, I don't know how long or for how much longer we can kind of sustain that approach before, um, you know, I heard somebody reference kind of we, we will have a GPU-induced climate change problem. So, um, so IBM is also um, uh, very uh, much invested in looking at um, what's next after GPUs, so um, these things um, involve um, um, not only uh, changes to existing uh, architectures, but, um, uh, you know, things like um, uh, analog memory uh, devices and even quantum computing. And so I hope um, that you've, you've um, uh, kept up with some of the, the progress in quantum computing pr in particular. And um, we've also, um, in addition to the MIT announcement, also um, uh, made a $2 billion uh, investment in AI hardware research that, um, again, um, will focus on um, uh, not only um, a heterogeneous computing, as I like to call it, so the combination of, of traditional processors and, and specialized devices like FPGAs and GPUs, but um, also um, analog devices, analog memory, memory devices, um, approximate computing and things like that, that um, we'll f we feel will really, um, uh, uh, you know, drive uh, performance improvements for AI of the future. And then again, back to my point on um, quantum computing, 
Um, we we uh, just, in fact, yesterday announced some, uh, some significant uh, progress around the performance of, of quantum systems. And so quantum systems are not just about qubits, uh, but we like to um, refer to a concept of quantum volume, where you also consider um, uh, your, your ability to handle errors in these um, very... Um, you know, error-prone systems. So, um, and and this notion of what can quantum uh, do to for um, AI. This was a uh, recent event um, down at the MIT IBM lab, and there's uh, Yoshua Benjo with Peter Shore that um, uh, you know his um, a few years ago uh, caused some concern with um, uh, his uh, algorithm that suggests if we have a quantum system that's large enough, we have some risks to our. Um, um, uh, security systems um, uh, and RSA and things like that. So um, that um, uh, is uh, it in a nutshell. Again, I touched on, on many different topics, but um, uh, thank you for your time. And, and um, if you'd like to hear about any more of this or um, have questions about um, where you see things going or what IBM is doing in different spaces, um, please reach out. <laughs>